What are some of the things that really jumped out at you? Well, I, I, I was surprised Cincinnati was as low as six. I, I don't think it's as dire as it has been painted. I think there is a window for them to climb it's simply because Ohio State and Michigan State are both ahead of them, and, and they've got a lot of tough games left. And Alabama and Georgia are going to play one another, and I and I have every reason to believe, based on what I've seen, that Georgia's going to beat Alabama and, and beat everybody else. So, you know, at least a couple of teams, I think, are going to fall. Now, you know, the question becomes simply, is, is beating a really good SMU team enough hand in hand with having that win at Notre Dame and you know the evidence from last night would seem to say it may not be enough and we just got to wait and see yeah and and it would help them you know before that game if 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 at all possible for SMU to get into the rankings and then even to push it further if uh if Cincinnati would would be able to play Houston in the the American uh conference championship uh, I guess there's at least a shot Houston could be ranked by then before they have to uh, before they have to set their final ranking. So I, I, I'm with you, and in fact, I think I was one of those people that um, was was a little too dramatic about what this meant for Cincinnati. Because you're right, there are a few different routes in there, uh, and there could be losses in front of them. And look, Oklahoma's hanging, Michigan's hanging behind them, and you know, Michigan certainly. Uh, has got a couple of games that they could lose, you know, Ohio State. Uh but and and Oklahoma has got got a really tough schedule from here on out. I mean, you know, they're they're playing the best teams in the conference and so Cincinnati could thread the needle. I I, I agree with you. Well they could and, and what but what's maddening about it, Bernie, is it's so painfully obvious to me anyway that the best thing for the sport would be for a Cincinnati when you can justify them making the playoff for them to make it. Right. And, you know, and in that sense, I think you have to admire the committee's integrity because they don't give a damn. <laughs> you know, they, they continue and, and it's, you know, it, it, it's, we're at the point where people are, are painting it as a, as a, a power five invitational, you know, which is why it, I guess is how the talk of expanding the playoff has arisen. But, you know, I think if if you can't find a way, based on what we know now, and things could certainly change, if you can't find a way, based on what we know now, to say Cincinnati is one of the top four, uh, you know, what else do you need to know? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, other than Oregon going to uh, Ohio State, I mean, it's the best, uh, it's the, it's the best non-conference win of the year, and uh, sec- second best road win of the year. Um, and Notre Dame's ranked tenth in the first unveiling, and that's gives it even more credibility. So it'll be interesting. And I, another thing I know, and it, look, having Alabama in the top four, especially second, we we knew that that was going to be a fire starter. Um, whether it made sense or not, it's just going to be a fire starter. Period. What what was your thought of that? Did you have any problem with that? I didn't really have a problem with it because I I think the gap between Georgia and everybody else is so large. I don't know that it it you know that there is a clear number two. Uh, you know, I, the the show last night the logos took so long after Reese would say and number whatever is that in the case of number two, I thought maybe they're not going to name a number two, <laughs> you know, and, and 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 with good reason, you know. And, and I'm not saying anything's over yet. Uh, you know, I remember very well the Heisman Trophy I awarded Leonard Fournette in 2015 that he didn't win. You know, but uh, there's five games left. But up to this point, I think Georgia is just so much better than everybody else. Ivan Mazel's with us from On3.com. I'm a subscriber. Uh, I know that others at the station are. And you can keep up with uh, just his daily briefing is is worth it uh, in and of itself. But great place for recruiting information too. And uh, and I'm no, I, I'm noticing you that keep adding more writers and covering more things. So that's great. And it's the uh, subscription is uh, well well worth the price. It really is. Um, all right. Do you buy the theory that 
if Alabama can avoid losing at Auburn, and that'll be a tricky game, but if they, if they, if they can avoid losing at Auburn, they win at Auburn. Auburn right now is ranked 13th. That would help Alabama's resume. The theory that, okay, they play the SEC. It's a dog fight. No pun intended. It goes down to the wire. Somebody kicks a field goal. Uh, Georgia wins by a point. They win by three points, something like that. And, Alabama w- would get into the four as a two team as a two loss team. I could buy that given that scenario. I mean, you know, that's the beauty of the playoff and is that we all have such great hypotheticals. Right. Uh, and you know, somebody just asked me today, do you think Auburn, if they ran the table, could make it as a two-loss team? I said, absolutely. That would mean they were an SEC champion that knocked off Alabama and Georgia, which is what they did in 2013 to make it to the last uh, the last BCS game. Uh, yeah, I don't think – I think the committee and Bill Hancock in particular take pride in saying they don't have any hard and fast rules. So I don't think it would – it, 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 I don't think it would be a great leap for them to to break that precedent. What What do you think now? You know, I, we're based in St. Louis, as you know, and you know we've, we're an eight SEC country. We're also in Big Ten country, and most of my focus is there. You know, watching those two great conferences. But um, thirteen of the twenty five spots are, are taken by Big Ten or SEC teams. Seven SEC, uh, six Big Ten, but but a lot of the a lot of the top. 10 or 12, same thing. Um, is that good for football or not? Of course not. <laughs> right. I tried to set one up for you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, that was an 83-mile-an-hour fastball. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, um, no, it's not, and that sort of gets circles back to the, the argument about Cincinnati. But uh, it was fascinating to me. I'm not even going to make fun of it because I haven't really – I haven't – really sat down and looked at it but just that they had mississippi state at 17 you know and nobody else has them ranked um so uh well i think what it says is you know the the most powerful they are equating the most powerful two conferences as being the best at football and i think this year that's probably the case but i don't know that it's that that there's that big of a gap between those two and everybody else and you look at the big 10 and i'm not disparaging the big 10 but i'm I'm questioning the committee and to your point you know what's the point of having a committee if we can't second guess what they do all the time but you know you look at wisconsin and i know they've won four in a row but that's a three loss team you know like what are they doing in there um, and, and, and that high actually. And then, you know, Minnesota loses to Bowling Green at home. And I really appreciate the job PJ Fleck has done keeping that team solvent and winning and all that stuff. But you lost to Bowling Green at home and they're ranked 20th. And, uh, even Iowa, which obviously was, was terrific early on, you know, they've lost two in a row and, and they were sort of non competitive games. I think they're outscored. Uh, you know, forty-one to fourteen in the two games, and they're in there. And I, I'm, I don't know that I'm saying they shouldn't be in there, but it, it just seems like exceptions are made uh, for these two conferences. Yeah, and it's almost a chicken and egg thing. You know, they're saying that these are the most powerful conferences, and then, and then once you establish that, then the losses carry more weight, and the wins carry more weight. So. Self-fulfilling prophecy, I guess, would be a more accurate uh, cliche. <laughs> right. It, but, no, that's right. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, Iowa is, uh, you know, they I, they were dominant in the first half of the season. So I, I, I didn't have a real problem with them still being ranked, even though they've lost two. I was surprised at Wisconsin, absolutely, uh, because they were so bad. I mean, in, at the beginning of the year. and uh, and in, But in that sense, I, I thought, Having OU at number eight was was reasonable, given the way that you know the, they have won so few style points in the way they've won, and have struggled with teams that aren't very good. Uh, but it just doesn't seem like they apply that criteria uniformly. Uh, no doubt about it. Hey, I wanted to ask you about something you had in the daily daily briefing, and I'm, our guest is our friend 
Ivan Bazel from on3.com and the daily briefing, a big part of that. One of the reasons why you should subscribe, but you, you, uh, you wrote a little something on Scott Frost in Nebraska. They, they host uh, Ohio State this Saturday. So this would be their chance to maybe do something really shocking, but, um, his future at Nebraska and, and I, I liked your, your, your take on it, your read on it, and I won't give it away. What tell, tell our listeners about, uh, Scott Frost and, and maybe how Nebraska could handle this. Well, you know, I, I, uh, I just felt like they're close. They're really close. And he said as much Monday. I thought what he said Monday was, was really refreshing to see a coach acknowledge that, yeah, I don't understand, you know, we're losing and, and I'm baffled by it too. And, and I understand that people are frustrated. I'm frustrated, you know, and I'm paraphrasing what he said, but it made me think of, you know, the patron saint of all those coaches, who is Frank Beamer. And I think his first six years at Virginia Tech, he was 16 games under 500 cumulatively and went 2-8-1 and one in that sixth season. And then he went on to win at least 10 games in 13 of the next 17 years, and, and he's now in the Hall of Fame. And he's on the college football playoff committee now that I think about it. And so, you know, it it was just going to be interesting. What occurred to me is that was a long time ago. I mean, Frank, you know, Frank came to his crisis moment 30 years ago uh, when dinosaurs roamed the college football earth. I mean, the sport has changed immensely in that time and, and, and ADs have a lot shorter fuse than they used to. And it's just going to be fascinating to see what Trev Albert's, does and how he decides to handle this. Ivan Mazel with us. I, Ivan, before we let you go, on, get on with your your day. And I know I, I was just uh, snooping around, and I, I it looks like you have a book signing event tonight. And and I know that y- you've enjoyed uh, getting the word out on your your new book. And 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 it is it's, it's absolutely out right now, right? Or is are these things pre? Yeah, yeah. Pub- uh, was published last week. Okay, published that's before. what I thought. And and. Uh, I keep trying to catch his eye, tells the story of your late son, Max. And I'm glad to see that uh, you're getting all these invitations to speak and you get the word out about your book. I can't wait to read the book. And um, it looks like, not that this is a surprise, my friend, but it looks like the reception to, to, to the book, is, which is certainly uh, straight from the heart, your heart, um, is getting a fa- fantastic reception. People are, are touched by it, moved by it. Um, and, and just, uh, you know, um, just respecting, uh, the hell out of you for, 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 you know, putting this all out there for the public so they can get a better understanding of, uh, what, a, what a lot of people, but a lot of young people in particularly the, some of the, some of the, you know, risks out there that some of the things that are going on in their lives that we don't know about. So. Uh, thank you for writing the book. Uh, I, I mean, I, I mean it cause I, uh, I go through this in my own life as far as depression and it's, uh, it can be a terrible, terrible thing. And there are times where it's just, you know, you just have awful thoughts and I don't mean to get so heavy with you, but I'm just saying I, no. something like this touches me because I, I you know, I've, I, I never had to deal with the tragedy you and Meg did, but uh, but but I kind of I know that darkness is what I'm trying to say. So anyway, no, I understand and I appreciate it. I mean, you know, I was I've been treated for depression in my life, and and I, I we just decided early on, Bernie, in the early days when Max disappeared, and and uh, that we weren't going to be, we had never been ashamed of him, and we weren't going to be ashamed of him now. And mental illness needs sunlight. And and we just decided. And the last thing, as a journalist, I wanted to do was no comment anybody. So we we just decided we were going to be honest about it, and not didn't want us our being uh, secretive to be interpreted in any way that would uh, cast Max in a poor light. He was sick, and you know, then he died because of the illness. Well, I, um, if you don't mind sharing, what are, what are 
what's some of the feedback that you have received personally from either people that don't know you and have, have read it or people that you do know that have read it? I mean, what 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 what's the biggest part of uh, the message that maybe is resounding with people, or maybe it was just what you said to me a, a moment ago. But what, what what's the feedback that you're getting? Well, the reviews have been very good, and people have it, it, what I have n- noticed in the couple of weeks that I've begun to go to bookstores and to, and to talk about the book is just how quiet they are when I'm talking. It's like they are really focused in on on the story I'm telling. Uh, and the message that I really am trying to convey is, and this is what worked for me, your mileage may vary, all grief is individualistic, but that I, I just realized that the amount of grief I had for Max was equal to the amount of love I had for him. And, and, and if you boil that down the way that we as writers do, grief is love. It's a very painful form of love, but it, it, it is love. And, and once I understood that, that I was in that much pain because I loved Max that much, it just made it easier to carry the grief. And that's what you do. You don't get over grief. You just learn to carry it with you. Well, I hope that our listeners um, that may be, de- de- well, they don't have to be dealing with anything to, to appreciate and, and treasure uh, the power of this book, but especially if if they're touched by any of this uh, in a level that's personal uh i hope i hope they strongly consider you know buying a copy of the book and it's i keep trying to catch his eye ivan mazel m a i s e l and i assume i know it's hatchet the hatchet publishes it but c- can anybody get that on amazon or you know what what's the best way to get it Sure. I mean, it, it's available, you know, as they say, wherever books are sold. I mean, it, it's on Amazon. It's on the Barnes & Noble site, Books A Million, at independent bookstores. I'm at Square Books in Oxford, Mississippi tonight. Uh, I am trying to hit as many independent bookstores as I can because I like independent bookstores. But certainly it's available on all the big websites. And, and I really appreciate you bringing that up. Oh, absolutely. Uh, really glad to be able to talk to you for a lot of reasons, but especially that. I uh, want to get the word out about, about your book, and we can do this again in a few weeks and just uh, get an update and uh, k- keep track of the you know the kind of reception it's getting. And I'm really happy for you that uh, people pe- people are moved by this and they, they want to read it and they, they really get something out of it. So, yeah, continue that tour. Ivan Maisel on tour. <laughs> Pro- probably not probably not like Leonard Skinner, but still on on tour nonetheless <laughs> well i tell you this I, the people the new people magazine uh gave it a, a little short review and i'm on the same page as paul mccartney in his lyrics book so <laughs> as far as i'm concerned you know it's me and sir paul there you go man that, oh that's beautiful that's absolutely beautiful thanks for sharing that i got a i got a good giggle out of that that's funny but that's also very cool well, uh, <laughs> be uh, be well, and uh, we'll talk enough soon. And, again, thanks for all the good work at On3.com. And, again, the book, I Keep Trying to Catch His Eye, uh, by Ivan Mazel about uh, the story of his late son, Max. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're the man, Bernie. Thanks. Thank you. That's my dear friend. Uh work with him in Dallas and respect him as much as anybody that I've ever worked with and I got to say, though, and Jim, I'm not trying to get too heavy with you or anyone, but mm-hmm. I'm going to read this and probably have a uh, box of Kleenex set up when I get to work on it. But um, the way him and his wife, Meg, have handled this, uh, it's just uh, it's just incredible. I mean, I you know, you can't even comprehend, you know, your parents of a child, a young, you know, young child, you know, Max was college age and one day he disappears and. They don't know what's. They don't know what happened. Where is he? Is it, was he in an accident? Mm-hmm. Right. And you know, it, it the the worst fears were were true. You know, he he ended his own life, and um, the way Ivan has handled this using his public platform, and he's he's even gone as far as to go to families. You know, he wrote this incredible book, and 
He's even gone to family, some that we don't know about that he keeps private. But there was a kid, a f- you may remember this, Jim, and some of our listeners may remember this. There was a, there was a kid, and I forget his name, which is awful, but I'm bad with that, names. There was a young man who was a quarterback at Washington State um, who committed suicide. That's right, yes. Uh, and his little brother then went on to play at, at, at South Carolina uh, for a couple years. Um, and I haven't reached out to his parents and, you know, f- flew out to, uh, California. I think that's where his parents live and just, just tried to do what he could to guide them through this and how you handle it and what's important to, to do for your own well being and to help yourself get through it. And he just, um, uh, he's got a great human touch. So this isn't just like, well, I'm going to write a book and, he he wants to be very much direct and hands on as far as uh, helping parents or anyone that finds themselves in a unspeakably horrific and and sad situation like this. And I got to say too, and I again, man, I, for all of you, I appreciate you tolerating me getting heavy with this stuff. But it's a he's a friend of mine, and it's a it's it's just a, a powerful story uh, born out of tragedy, but. I got to say the uh, and I didn't want to tell him this so maybe I'm a coward. Uh the photo the photo on the book cover will break your heart. Yes it will. I mean it'll okay. break your heart. But if that's a window into a powerful story that can actually shed a lot of light and perspective on how to handle grief that's okay. You know, that's okay. But that, it's a, it's a, just an absolutely beautiful photo, but it will break your heart. That's all I'll say. It really will. I've seen the cover and I, you're right. A hundred percent. So when you know the background of the story, you'll go, wow. Anyway, isn't Ivan Maisel, uh, he would get mad at me for saying this and I don't mean it literally, but, uh, isn't he a saint? I'm telling oh, you. No doubt. I, look, he's, I, he's something else, man. I, I love that guy. I don't need to tell you this, but. Our lives, when we were younger, that was something you couldn't talk about. Right, right. And our society is starting to figure out it's okay. It is okay. It's healthy. It's important. It's necessary to talk about those issues now and um, get through them because you get through them by letting them out and getting help from others. I, I, it, it was like an impulse thing, but I shared, I shared my story, which I had never shared with anybody uh, on the athletic and, um, I shared it because I felt like I needed to just sort of break out, bust loose. And just, uh, also I sensed that there's a lot of people going through what I was going through. And so I, I, but I, it's really, it was really weird for me to do that for, you know, I know I'm a loud mouth on the radio, which is one facet of my personality. It's not a fake. It's not an act. It's, you know, when it comes to sports, I like to have fun in that kind of like trash talking way. And yeah. Just, throwing your opinions down but i think i've told you this before you know but away from the mic um i am a an unusually quiet man <laughs> i swear people won't <laughs> people people will not believe that but but i am i'm very shy in public uh at homes i'm i'm totally cool with silence and my wife's fine with that she gets <laughs> it she doesn't mind um so there's like a you know there's 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 like one whole side of my personality and there's another one that people don't know about and uh it was just unusual for me to, i'm pretty open in a lot of ways but just to 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 write what i wrote and the only reason i'm bringing it up i'm not trying to win any hero medal it's not at all i mean it was hard to write because you're, you're sort of putting yourself out there and you're also wondering is this excessive am, am i is this am i doing it like am i going to be perceived as a guy that's doing this for attention or or you know you I, I run all those things th- through my mind, you know, because I, j- I just know how the world gets, right? Mm-hmm. And um, I wouldn't have r- written it unless it was just something really meaningful and something I, f- I just felt like a pull really strong to do. It's just funny. That day, and I don't think he's listening, but he'll smile, and I hope he does. If he's listening, he'll chuckle. I had lunch that day before I wrote this with Ben Fredericks in the Post-Dispatch, my friend, and I I told him, he I said, well, yeah, I got to get uh, – I got to get home. I got to write something for uh, Colin Fay Athletic. And he said, what are you going to write about? And I said, I, I'm doing a Matt Carpenter column. So I don't know how the hell I go from a Matt, 
Carpenter column, getting ready to write that, where I'm just all of a sudden I'm like, no, you know what I'm going to write? I just need to, bu- I just need to break this out. I just, I need to just get it selfishly, just get it out of my system and and make it public, and and then maybe, maybe some some way this will also help me, but more than anything, help others. And um, the reception to that piece was great. I mean, just great. People were amazing and. Uh, the most touching thing about it is that, you know, so many people, you know, said they go through it, you know, reading my story kind of made them feel like, okay, there, there's a lot of people out there who really understand this, you know, and yeah. your your piece just strengthened that belief, you know, so, because you're right, man, there's, there was a time you just never talked about this stuff. The re- no, when I, I remember specifically when I grew up, hey, we don't talk about that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Right. I'll keep my mouth shut. I grew up with it. Um, my, on my mother's side of the family, you know, my, my grandfather, who's a huge, uh, huge influence in my life. I grew up with a Polish set of grandparents and a Southern set of grandparents. That's why I'm so weird. I just, I've come from all, all, <laughs> all ranges of, of the, of, of the American life, you know? <laughs> and, um, so anyway, but my, my grandfather, my mother's side, Herb, Herbert Andrews, he, uh, him and him and his uh, his wife, my maternal grandmother, they were. They, I know this sounds ridiculous, but it's true. They were orphans in Norfolk, Virginia, and they met each other because they were in an orphanage. And wow. they got married at, <laughs> like when they were teenagers, and they spent their whole life together. And my my grandfather came from nothing, obviously, and he he ended up, you know, in effect, like running a factory and, you know, m- you know, built a comfortable life for his kids, my, including my mother, and built his own house, like, right on the river that's a tributary of the Chesapeake Bay. I mean, I can't tell you how many days, you know, I- I'd go crabbing off that pier or fishing off that pier or just jump off the pier into the into the river. Can you imagine? I mean, it's like just to, to have a grandparent, grandparents with a with a house like that then of course my other grandparents had a store including all the candy and ice cream a a, a young brat a, a, a young bernie like me could eat people say like well have you always had a weight pro-? yeah well what well you ever heard that expression <laughs> you ever heard that expression kid in a candy store yeah that's me all right <laughs> so anyway i had a great childhood but anyway let me but the thing of it is, we we would have these great family gatherings uh, down at Herb's house, right? And they'd have these summer crab feasts and all this other stuff. And he'd be, you know, everything's fine. He's drinking beer. He's he's, you know, he's picking crabs. There's music playing. Everybody's in a good mood. And I noticed a pattern. And even even when we were just like having dinner inside or whatever, you know, I noticed a pattern. After a while, you know, he just he would stop talking. And. I was a really observant kid. Maybe that was the future sports writer in me or something. Mm-hmm. And I'd always think, oh, like, what? I hope nothing's wrong or, you know, what's he thinking about? Or I hope, you know, somebody didn't make him mad or what. He'd just sit there in silence. And then after a while, he'd just slip away. He would just, just leave. Mm-hmm. And he'd go, he'd go to a, his bedroom, close the door quietly. No scene, no disturbances, no noise. Just go in his bedroom, you know, and, and that's... I'd always ask my mother, I said, well, what, you know, I, I didn't understand. I was a right. little, little yeah. fellow, but I came to understand it, you know, at a certain age. And it, it just pains me now that he lived at a time where you never talked about it. You just didn't. And I just wonder how, you know, how much did that man who's such a good man, how much did he suffer because of that? Where if he would have been felt like it was, Oh, you know, you could be open. You go to doctors to talk about it. You can go, go, you know, go, go to a therapist to talk about it. If nothing else, he would have got the medication to just kind of lift whatever darkness he, he was living under a lot of times. Right. You know, that stuff breaks your heart in retrospect. So anyway, I didn't mean to get all personal, but my goodness, we talk a lot of sports. So, um, right. so Ivan Mazel was, uh, he touched a nerve in a good way. Absolutely. So and his book is out there. It is. It's it's fantastic, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to get to actually reading it soon. Maybe I've been putting it off, right? <laughs> maybe I've There's been a lot going off. on. Yeah, so I might might because it's like I don't. Maybe I don't want to like be crying 
like all day long or something. Oh, that could be. So, but I, but we'll be getting to it. One, one second here, I'll get back on track. You know how I am. Once I get started on something, right, Jim? What, but I wanted to get you, bring you into the conversation on the first college football playoff unveiling. What was the number one thing that surprised you? Uh, it surprised me that the committee, not that they don't deserve it, that the committee put Alabama too. Well, I, that, I, yeah, that, I, I, I get that. Um, and again, not because if you ask me who the two best teams are in the country, I will tell you it is Georgia and Alabama. But knowing how the committee works their way through whatever it is they want to tell you that the that that's why they did what they did, <laughs> and just stand tight because that'll change. The, yes, a it's week later, change, it's going to change again in a week. But but, it, but even even they're telling you what they're what the criteria is. Oh, they'll change that too. It's it's coming. The change is coming, whether you like it or not. <laughs> But it surprised me that Alabama was two by the committee, knowing that, you know, there's a couple undefeated teams left and the bulk of what's to play out is still in front of us. I didn't expect Alabama to be one. I really expected Alabama to be four or five and then watch them move their way up as this, the rest of the season plays itself out because, again, every new week will come and they'll give you a new reason why they did what they did and, Oh, Alabama's won again, and this team didn't look real good, so we move them up further. But they're number two. That was the one thing that I went, oh, okay. I didn't I, have a problem with right. it. It just shocked me. There, you know, I that was one of the first things I dug into because I wanted to see, you know, uh, understand it. Uh, I mean, I did. I'm like you. I did understand it because mm-hmm. I watch, you know, college football all day long, every Saturday, and sometimes on Friday or even well, not on do the Wednesday games, but be, even on Friday. And that doesn't make me an expert, but it it does make me someone that has seen a lot of teams play, and certainly all of these teams that are in in these conversations. And I'm with you. Um, Honestly, you know, the two best teams I've seen are Georgia and Alabama. Now, there's going to be other teams that are going to have a chance to change that. And I do think the Alabama situation, or the, if it is a controversy, will resolve itself. Because uh, even though, like I talked to Ivan about this, you and I have mentioned it a couple times. I mean, it's possible that Alabama and Georgia both get into the, the, to the, to the four, but I don't know. I mean, I don't know that I would um, say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that'll happen if they, even if they lose to Georgia by a field goal, oh, you know, that'll happen. I, I can't go that far. I can't go that far. But uh, chances are it will resolve itself because either Alabama's going to get knocked off by Auburn, which is a tricky, tough team, uh, or, you know, Georgia will put a wampin on them. And if that happens, I mean, Alabama will fall, right? So I don't really have a problem with them starting out at two because uh, you know uh, here's why, and it's not it's really not any kind of SEC bias. Uh, I'm I'm glad that all those Big Ten teams are in there. If I want to be kind of regional in my bias, I can do that. But it isn't one conference; it's probably two. But then again, my favorite team plays in the American Conference, so uh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. You know, I always go to the Sagarin ratings for strength of schedule. Yes, and the, I do. Know, I do believe the committee is big on that, and they're pretty consistent on that. Well, Jeff Sagarin, he, like the top the top ten teams that were revealed last night. Here's where they rank in strength of schedule: Notre Dame ninth, uh, Alabama eighteenth, Georgia twenty fourth, Michigan thirty fifth, Ohio State forty third, Michigan State forty seven. Oregon, 64, Oklahoma, 70th, Wake Forest, 83rd, and Cincinnati, 94th. So that tells you something about Cincinnati and the predicament they're in, because even though they had that great win at Notre Dame, their strength of schedule is so weak otherwise that it just sort of took it took some of the juice out of that win yes, at Notre did. Dame. and. The the pickle that they're in is that I've been alluded to. You know, Cincinnati's even though they're sixth, it's it's going to be a it's going to be tough for them to jump up. Now they can because they're sixth, and then if you have some teams losing, I mean, certainly Ohio State could lose again. Certainly Michigan State could lose. They play each other, as a matter of fact. 
Um, and, you know, Oregon could lose because Oregon is, you know, it's Pac-12, and they've had some really unimpressive wins just in that conference, including losing to Stanford. But they've even they had really close call, like, for example, at Cal, and Cal's terrible. So there's hope that way, but the problem is, if you're Cincinnati, the problem is, and I'll get back to Alabama, and I apologize. The problem is, if you're Cincinnati, is that your remaining schedule is so weak. It, it, again, unless SMU can jump into the top 25, and we're talking about the committee's top 25, not the AP poll. Right. Um, if Notre Dame keeps winning, that helps Cincinnati, because that gives their win at Notre Dame even more uh, more clout. But Maybe by the time they play SMU at Cincinnati, uh, SMU will be in the rankings because it's got to be close. SMU's really good. Houston, I think, is really good. They could play Houston, Cincinnati, I'm talking about, in the uh, the American Conference Championship. Um, so th- there's some upward movement there. There's some possibilities. But what could happen to them is the whole strength of schedule thing because – I could see the committee moving a one-loss team ahead of Cincinnati or keeping uh, a team, maybe say a Michigan State loses, keeping them ahead of Cincinnati just simply based on the strength of schedule. And the strength of schedule is a real thing. I Look, I got no dog in this fight. I respect the hell out of Cincinnati and what they've done, but but I, I'm not going to like go on, go on, you know, some crusade because the reality is not all schedules are the same, and it's got to be factored in. And the real problem, which I'll get to in a minute, is that the very people that would be greatly helped by having a 12-team format are mad at Greg Sankey, commissioner of the SEC, because Texas and Oklahoma reached out wanted to see if it was possible about getting something done. And Greg Sankey said, well, yeah, we'll invite you in. You want to come to the SEC? We'll invite you in. Everybody got mad at Greg Sankey. Everybody going to get revenge on Greg Sankey. Who does he think he is for taking a call from Oklahoma and Texas and saying, okay, if you if you want to come here, we'll be happy to have you. How dare he do that, even though all these other conferences do the same thing. They're just mad that it's Oklahoma and Texas going there. Yep. Um, but all these people have reacted by saying, well, we're, Hey man, we don't like what Sankey did. We're going to slow this t- train down. We're going to, sl- in fact, we're going to stop it. We're going to stop it. And I tell you what, if we're going to do anything, if we're going to sign off on anything, this is all these different conference people, right? Different conferences. If we're going to do anything at all. You know, it'll be eight teams. It won't be four. It'll be eight. So. You look at this, and it's like the people, and I'm talking about conference commissioners and all university presidents and all these different conferences, the very same people who would benefit the most by a 12-team 12 playoff, 12 team playoff, right? They're mad at Greg Sankey, and they're being diaper babies about it, right? And so you know what their revenge is by pulling the plug or slowing, slowing it down, the 12-team format, by st- standing in front of it, blocking it? You know what their revenge is? Their revenge is hurting their own teams. It is. Their revenge is keeping, the if they stay with four or even only go to eight, fewer of their teams will get an opportunity to compete for a national championship. If you got 12 that gets in, you will have a chance to show us what you got. You cut it to eight, fewer of them will get a chance to show us what they got. And all it'll do, all that would do, eight, is mean that the Big Big Ten and SEC, a lot of years, virtually guaranteed of having two teams in the playoff, right? Each one of them. So these idiots are spiting themselves. They're, they're getting revenge on Greg Sankey because they're mad at Greg Sankey. Well, we'll show you. We'll show you. We're going to stop a system that would put more of our teams in. We're going to stop a system that will actually get one of our teams in for the first time. We're going to block that because we're mad at you. Well, aren't you working against yourself? We're we're going to show you, Greg Sankey. Yeah, I mean, Jim, you and I have been around a long time. Uh-huh. Does it get any dumber than that? No. When I, when I heard that, it, that thing is a disaster. It, I don't even think it's going to... 
it'll hold water much longer because it'll break itself up. You know, when they made the decision, the announcement, and they said, well, there's no written agreement, signed agreement, yeah. but we're not going to deal with them anymore. Well, then like a week later, I saw a couple SEC teams were getting scheduled games with teams in the past well, sure. 12. And I'm like, sure. well, wait a minute. What are you guys? But Are, I, are you tough guys? Are you really gonna, going against it? Or And to your point, like the Pac-12 group yeah. that we'll call them, if you don't have an eight-game playoff, you're not invited. A lot of the years they wouldn't be. You're not going to be there. I don't even know that Oregon will survive all the way to the, to, right. to the four this year. Uh, it, the, you know, as far as like the Big 12 group, now Oklahoma's leaving, but if Oklahoma hasn't been getting in, you're not invited either. So why would you limit an opportunity to get more teams in that would include you? Because if not, you're not getting in. Yeah, let's see. They let me let me get this straight. So they're complaining and complaining and complaining with by the way, with some some legitimacy, complaining and complaining and complaining and complaining. You know, we get excluded from this. No matter what we do, we're we're going to be get snubbed by this. They are not going to let us in. Complain, 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 complain. So the guy who's the most powerful commissioner in that sport says, "Oh no, here's here we're going to go with this format cuz it's going to be good for the sport to have more teams involved." So he comes up with a format that will make sure that everybody, you know, that has a good team in a particular conference or whatever, we can make sure that more of those, that the people that have been complaining, more of their teams are going to get in, or they're going to get in for the first time, or they're going to get a shot for the first time. And so they're complaining, well, you, they just keep blocking us out. They just ignore us. They, the, the fix is in and all this stuff. Well, the, the guy that can change this and wants to change it is the guy that runs the SEC. But they're mad at him, and they're like, "Well, the thing you're complaining about, you're, and the thing that would solve your your complaint, right? Would 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 make you happy? Because all you want is to be able to participate yeah. in the playoff, right? Well, he he's trying to do that for you. It's like so so. What are you complaining about anyway? I've wasted too much time oh, on these idiots. It, but it, the ACC is the same thing this year. Yeah. If Clemson isn't good like, and dominant like they are this year, yeah. you're not invited either. Wake's going to have a hard time. Wake could become an undefeated ACC team that won't be invited in. Right. They're just not that good. Um, all right, back to Bama. So I, I cited, you know, their strength of schedule is 18th. That's the second best uh, on the on the top 10 on this list that, that from the, the college football yeah. playoff com- uh, committee. Their their second strongest schedule. All right. Uh, the other thing is, you know, they. Um, that loss to Texas A&M is no longer as damaging as it appeared at the time because you know why Texas A&M is actually playing really well. Mm-hmm. And they're, they were ranked 14th by the committee. There's no shame uh, even for Alabama to lose a game literally on the last play when A&M kicked a field goal to beat them by three. It was not Alabama's finest hour. But the point is the committee, believe it or not, has been consistent about this, and it sounds weird. But they're not they're not overly concerned or uh, they're not going to punish you uh, for, for having one loss as long as you are playing other, other ranked teams and beating ranked teams that offset your one loss. And people don't want to hear it, but Alabama has actually been doing that because, um, you know, it's a situation where they have played um, – let me get this. I'm sorry, man, my friend. I got a, my phone is doing things it shouldn't be doing. I thought that was me. No. Um, because, you know, Alabama has wins over ranked teams, including, you know, Mississippi State, including uh, Ole Miss, right? Yep. There's another one in there somewhere. And they've also played some some other – they've also won games over over some quality four and four teams, right? Um, so – They've offset that loss by just racking up some wins against other teams in the top twenty-five, and that's important. And they're doing it, so you get the top, you get the strength of schedule plus the fact that they are at least bagging some wins against top twenty-five, bagging some wins against four, uh, some four and four teams that are actually pretty dangerous. Uh, you know, the, the the conference, excuse me, the committee can overlook that. They can they not overlook it, but not give that one loss. 
as much weight because, again, that one loss is now what turns out to be 25, the 14th team in that top 25. So, I mean, that's the pragmatic reason Alabama's there. Now, people can just say, well, Bernie, be honest, it's just because it's Alabama. We have some of that, too. Yeah. So uh, it's not like Alabama's presence is illegitimate, right? I think <laughs> some of their a lot of their <laughs> reputation is earned. And, and I think Alabama, if you're going to get a little bit benefit of doubt, I think, you know, this isn't exactly a crime against humanity. Easy for me to say. So um, so that's just a couple of thoughts I had. And, boy, they do love the committee, loves the Big Ten. They love the SEC, 13 of the top 25. And four of the top five spots in the rankings. Georgia's one, Bama two, Michigan State three, Ohio State five. And more than half, like I mentioned, the seven uh, from the SEC, six from the Big Ten. The one that I thought, and I mentioned this to Ivan, you know, the committee, just unconditional respect. The committee saluting, saluting the Big Ten West. Minnesota's 20th despite losing at home to Bowling Green. Wisconsin's got three losses, yeah. and they don't have an offense. Yeah. Iowa has got no offense. And they've lost two straight, and they got outscored forty-one to fourteen. Now, Ivan's like, look, I, Ivan's like, look, I was so dominant earlier that they deserve to be in there for now, and he's probably right. But my point is, is that I thought it was just fascinating that the committee went out of their way to like re- make sure they, they got those teams in that top twenty-five. I mean, it, it, I'm just saying it's not. It just seemed unusual to me. It's nothing against Wisconsin, and I realize they've won four in a row, and they're looking better and better and better, right? It's just strange to look at, you know, the first time they unveil this, you got a three-team loss in there. That's all. It's as simple as that. No matter who that team would be, Mm -hmm. right? I'm there with you. So this stuff is, uh, this stuff is fun. And it's only, we got three more, four more weeks of this to debate each and every week because there'll be changes. There's, this is when the upsets start coming. You know, this is the holiday season now because we've had the first unveiling. And this is better than one of those, a lot better than one of them cheesy Hallmark Channel movies. Amen to that. Where they're standing, you know, they got the got the fake snowflakes, singing, uh, singing "Joy to the World." <laughs> two two kids falling and working through their troubles to fall in love and live happily ever after. As we all hear, you know, we all as "Oh Holy Night" plays in the background <laughs> on a set on a on a sound stage in Canada. Yeah. No, You've give me seen this. One or two of these. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Guilty pleasure, as a matter of fact, on occasion. Oh, right. Wow. Very big at our house, Mrs. Bernie. Uh, she plays the Halloween movies over and over and over again during the Halloween season. I mean, all day long. Yeah. And then they're all, they're like background in our house, right? Background <laughs> music in our house, right? That Halloween thing. Yep. And then comes the Hallmark Christmas movies, which, by the way, again. I have a little bit, little bit of a guilty pleasure. Okay, I will confess to that because they're funny <laughs> and they're cheesy. They are cheesy, and all those couples are they're, they're, those kids. You just were rooting for those kids to be able to get together and you know have a happy life that they dreamed of. It always works out. In There's the always end. something happens. There's always that curveball, you know, that threatens their happily ever after part. But they always get it fixed, right? Yep. 